Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of In the Barn. I'm Robin. And I'm Kelsey. And in today's episode, we're going to discuss two osteopathic procedures that are being shared more and more on social media. And yet the vet and science community seems to be staying fairly silent on the topic. Are gelding scar manipulations and ovary manipulations necessary procedures to ensure a healthy horse, or are they not worth the risk? We chose to do this topic or like look into it because I had seen a Facebook post recently that super like piqued my interest where someone had like gone to get on their horse and the horse had bucked and the immediate response someone like immediate feedback someone gave them was that this horse needed her ovaries manipulated not like it could have been a saddle fit like what else was going on in the moment and it just seemed like a really extreme response for something that could have been anything right like a horse bucked when you went to get on it could be like 1001 different things happened or reasons for that to happen and i just thought like what a strange response we should like touch her ovaries <laughs> i just seemed like a really interesting response and i had been seeing lots of discussion on, on facebook as well about gelding scar manipulation and gelding scar like whatever it is and so i was like i i want to know more because i have both a mare and geldings and like is this is this a thing is this really something they need or is this just like craziness well, I've noticed ovarian manipulation has like popped up and it's almost the new go-to where you know they used to throw ulcers at you and be like, does your horse have ulcers? This feels like the new thing for whenever mares come into question of like behavior. You're asking what's going on? Why are they behaving this way? And someone just throws in ovaries and they're like, have you checked their ovaries? Yes. Yeah. It's definitely, I think, going to be, it's on the rise as becoming the new like ulcers and ovaries and gelding scars i think those three are going to be the like go-to's for quite a while so i wanted to know more and that's that's why we're here it's why we have this podcast so that we can know more yes do you actually i actually have a question real quick do you know if ovarian manipulation if all those like manipulating the horse's bodies if it started in the u.s because i know it's widely accepted here in the states and it's uh, pretty widely accepted in Europe as well. But I was wondering, did it start here in Europe? So I'm not actually a thousand percent sure because equine osteopathic procedures, which what we'll talk about, and I do have a little bit of the history, did start in Europe. So those, the practices that are used on animals, it was an osteopath in Europe who was like, let's apply this to animals. And that happened in like the 90s. And then the big institute for osteopathy didn't open until like 2005, 2006. And so at that time, that person, and again, I'll get into this, developed i believe they are responsible for developing ovary manipulation and so that would have been in the 2000s when ovary manipulation and gelding scar manipulation became a thing okay it, it's mostly osteopathic procedures have really been pushed by europe which is interesting because osteopathic medicine is an american medicine yeah no it is it's interesting and i was curious because i know it's not widely accepted in australia yet and i was just trying to figure out where its country of origin was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is Europe. And I think like exactly which country, because the people are from a couple different countries. So like, I don't know exactly which country takes the... Yeah, so it's just a handful. Yeah, yeah. With that, let's jump into what is ovary manipulation. Yay. <laughs> I don't know why this always makes my stomach. I just like, I just clench my whole body. I'm like, ah. Nobody touched my ovaries. <laughs> I know. It's it's a queasy topic, I feel like. But okay. Ovary manipulation is also like what's referred to as like dealing with a displaced ovary. So like you would manipulate an ovary that's been displaced or has some sort of uh, like male position, like it's in the wrong place. Something has gone on with it. And so that's why you would do this procedure. So this comes from a blog post titled, What is Ovary Manipulation? Does my mare have PMS? This is was posted on exclusively Equine Vet Services page, and this is a vet clinic out of Australia, so you were right on that one. This is <laughs> written by or by like the staff of Dr. Lewis Cosgrove, who is a big proponent of this procedure as well as gelding scar um, manipulations. I did listen to a podcast with her, and in the podcast, she was shoulder deep in a mare during the podcast <gasps> and there was a point where she had to say i have to remove my arm because her sphincter is cutting off circulation and i was just like wow no. that woman is committed <laughs> like that's a rough podcast well, i found the same podcast but it was i found one for gelding she was 
arm deep in a gelding's butt. Yeah, I was just like, oh, that's commitment. That's, I was horrified. That's a lot of commitment. Yeah, and the sound quality was horrible, but like you could also totally hear stuff. And I was just like, I don't, this is, this is, this is a lot. This is a lot. <laughs> Not the audio experience I wanted, if I'm being honest. Not the audio experience I was looking for. But the blog post did not include the audio experience, so that was a little better. But anyways, so ovary manipulation is an osteopathic technique that is used to identify restrictions, adhesions, and male positioning of the internal organs and reproductive tract along the nerve and blood vessel pathway. So basically how... Uh, the mare's reproductive tract is set up is imagine the spine at the top of the horse's back and then you have the rectum and intestines below that spine and then you have what's called the broad ligament which is holding the reproductive tract kind of like wings coming down uh, and holding the ovaries which are then lower underneath the kidneys so then you have the kidneys there and then you have the ovaries down farther the other parts are underneath the rectum I, I don't want to say these words. <laughs> I, I know. And understanding the anatomy itself is hard enough. I'm just like, ah. Yeah. And I have like, the. it's really interesting. So this is something I do have a question about when it comes to ovary manipulation is I can see that like you do enter the rectum and you are in either the rectum or the intestine when you're moving the ovary around or like touching the ligaments and uterine stuff and fallopian tubes so i could see like how you can reach it but also like it's not the weirdest thing ever you're like in the intestine and you're to, like touching other organs like with the intestine like the intestine's like a glove on your hand and you're like moving i just got really stuck thinking about that and that really freaks me out now <laughs> no because like it's not a void like that's for some reason i was thinking you just like reached into the ab abdomen cavity and you could just like move everything around but no you're in the intestine guys like yeah I just, I get hung up on the, how did we, when did we think this was a good idea? Like, who was the first one that was like, hmm, if I just stick my hand in this hole, can use this intestine to move, or like this organ to move this thing, and it's going to be good. It's going to help them live so much better. Like, I just, who was the first one that was like, hmm. I did definitely try to find the origins of how this became a practice, because this doesn't, oh no, as far as I could tell from other osteopathic, like, this is the only osteopathic procedure, this and gelding scar manipulations, that requires, like, internal reorganization of the body parts. Yes, traditional osteopathic medicine includes surgery, but, like, this is the only manipulation I could find that was internal, and so I don't know how we got here. It's a bit of a foggy foggy route they took yeah okay but continuing on with what is ovary manipulation and how it works so the mare reproductive tract is positioned in the body with the ovaries sitting just behind the kidneys which that's the phrase from her blog which i don't love because the ovaries are below the kidneys i think in humans they would be behind the kidneys and a lot of the images that i see related to ovary manipulation in particular show the ovaries like way high up in the back where every other image that shows uh just like reproductive functioning and like the reproductive track does not show the ovaries that high up so i'm like super confused because one of the big reasons for ovary manipulations is that the ovaries get twisted and swollen and are pushing on the spine and the nervous cord the nervous system that runs along the spine i don't know why i can't think of the right word right now i can only think of nervous cord which is not a thing spinal cord nerves nerves i just want nerves <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to think of saying nerves i think i was putting nerves and spinal cord together into nervous cord <laughs> <laughs> it's the nervous cord of the horse the nervous cord of the horse no so they were show that the ovaries can like swell and they can push up on uh, the nerves that are underneath the spine. But then when I look at an image of how the reproductive tract is set up, I don't see how that's possible because the broad ligament is like a myo, it's like fascia looking. It's like this wide kind of thin wing and it is making contact with the ovaries. And so like a lot of the talk about the ovary manipulation is that the ovaries can twist or they can just basically wander off. And I find that really hard. Like I just don't understand how that's happening because from the graphics I've seen, that doesn't really seem possible. Um, I know she does talk, Louise Cosgrove talks about the uh, fascia or the broad ligament being pinched and restrictions to the blood flow happening in that. And I can kind of see how that would happen. But again, I'm slightly confused. Oh, I'm just, I'm also confused on the whole like organ moving and wandering off because, well, you know how they always showed you in health class or like, if you take the small intestine and you stretch it out, it's like 40 something feet long, just jammed inside your abdomen. There's not just a blank cavity of space in there. Like everything is chock full 
of organs and things doing things. So like, where would it even wander to? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And I don't know because they talk a lot about like ovaries being positioned high. And so like, again, I've never been in there. Like, in, <laughs> so obviously this has to come from somewhere. But I do get really confused because the only people who are talking about the ovaries being positioned in the wrong place are people talking about osteopathic medicine or osteopathic manipulations. And so like talking about ovaries, there's a lot of research into ovary health in mares. Like this is a huge area that's been researched, especially for reproduction. Like we want more babies. How do we improve breeding when it comes to mares, health of the ovaries? There's been a lot of studies into that. Ovaries are like the mares ovaries and the cells that are make up uh, equine ovaries are very similar to human ovaries. So there's also been a lot of studies looking at that. And yet none of them seem to be talking about the ovaries being located in a strange place. So it's either are they not looking for it and therefore not noting it or are they just not finding it? So the male position of the ovary can not only cause pain, but can disrupt blood and hormone flow if the vessels are twisted and kinked. The fascia around the ovary can also become constricted and prevent the ovary from expanding as follicles grow, causing visceral pain. And visceral is like organ pain, I think. Visceral gets, that word visceral gets used a lot and it's actually very confusing because I think it means something sometimes and like, does it mean things others so I don't know if this means organ pain or if this means like actual physical pain on the horse I don't know they use the word visceral a lot um, so each cycle the ovaries rotate towards the fallopian tubes so the ovarian fossa lines up with the fallopian tubes to allow the egg or ovum to exit the ovary at ovulation and enter the fallopian tube there and hopefully find sperm the ovary then rotates back to its normal position but sometimes this doesn't happen which again, I don't fully understand if that's how it works, but I, I'm just gonna go with it. The ovary can keep rotating and twisting on itself, which seems really challenging because the ovary is like fully, like fully attached. It's not just like, I thought at first the ovary was just like on a string, like just at the end of the fallopian tube and could just like spin around, but it's not. It is held in place by that broad ligament and it's like, it's fully attached. It's not unattached. Like, yes, it's a little lump and the fallopian tube is a string, but like that's all attached to the ligament. So I don't understand how it just can twist and get moved around. Some ovaries can be can have an inflammatory response and adhere or attach to abdominal walls. This can also cause adhesions between the bladder and the uterus. Other problems can be enlarged and heavy ovaries, which pull on the ligament. That absolutely seems super true to me, especially when you uh, look at like ovaries that have cancer and tumors, if they become swollen or they become heavy or they're not functioning properly, yes, then I can absolutely see an enlarged ovary pulling and hanging down and that causing a lot of pain. So like that piece of it, I absolutely yeah. believe is real. It absolutely makes sense to me. But like the rest of it, like I don't understand how it twists. And Ovarian torsion, if that is occurring, is something that's pretty serious. So in humans, ovary torsion does, or ovarian torsion does occur sometimes. It's very rare. And if it happens, you are likely extremely sick. Like your appendix bursts sick. You're in a lot of pain. You're vomiting. Like it's an emergency. You need to get to the hospital and get into emergency surgery because blood flow is being restricted to your ovaries. That I was not able to find ovary torsion not related to pregnancy talked about in horses. So this didn't really seem to be something that was occurring in horses. Yes, ovarian torsion does occur in late stage pregnancy for some mares, and that is relatively studied and understood. But as far as it happening without the mare being pregnant or without something else happening to those ovaries, it's pretty rare. So I did find a 1997 case study titled Ovarian Torsion Associated with uh, Granuloso Theca Cell Tumor in a Mare. This is the only time that I saw, um, again, ovary torsions talked about, not related to pregnancy. So one study in 1997, and it's just like this horse had a tumor on one of her ovaries. And so they hospitalized her for further evaluation of that affected ovary. And what they found was that that ovary had actually twisted clockwise 720 degrees and that that had cut off circulation. And when they removed the ovary, they found that it was basically, it had um, that tumor, but it was also like dead and really like, disgusting because it had been that it had been twisted for so long so how exactly it got twisted I don't know because like they don't maybe they explain it and I just missed it in the language but 
it had a tumor. So like it wasn't a healthy ovary to begin with and it weighed more than it should have. And it was like dying and quite sick. So that's the only time ovary torsion is ever mentioned. And in the scientific literature that I could find, but it was caused by a tumor being on that ovary. Yeah, and I have a hard time imagining that like healthy ovaries because I know I just feel like they kind of take advantage of the actual real call like complications that occur with ovaries such as, you know, cysts or tumors and then that torsion. I feel like they're kind of taking advantage of that and are like, oh, you got to manipulate the ovaries to prevent this from happening. But I don't think that necessarily applies to a normal healthy horse. I mean, it shouldn't. Absolutely, it shouldn't. And I think like scans, do scans all day long to see if it has that, like the cyst or the tumor or something of that nature. But I don't think you necessarily need to be concerned about it unless you have one of those problems happening. You know what I mean? So if your horse has a tumor, if your mare has a tumor, there are some very specific signs to look out for. One of them is stallion-like behavior. So if that mare is exhibiting stallion-like behavior, there is a good chance that she has a tumor on her ovary, especially that, that granulosa tumor, because what happens when that tumor develops on the ovary is it causes uh, an increase in the production of testosterone. It does not interfere with the production of estrogen or progesterone, but it does increase the amount of testosterone that horse is produced, that mare is producing, which then causes stallion-like behavior, right? Which Because she's responding to that extra testosterone, which I think that is a very specific symptom that is happening. And if that is happening, you should absolutely be looking at tumors on our ovaries, not necessarily ovary manipulation, but you will find in the symptoms your horse needs her ovaries manipulated, stallion-like behavior is one of them. And does she need her ovaries examined for stallion-like behavior? Absolutely. Is like, you need to make sure that there's no tumor on there, basically. There's also like in that um, test, also you can do blood work to can look at that blood work to look at the hormone levels and test. So if like her hormone level for testosterone is in a elevated range, then you also know there's a good chance she has a tumor on her ovary. And then there's also like um, prolonged heat cycles because her heat cycle will get uh, messed with with the change in hormone levels. So there are like real signs of issues with ovaries that you need to be looking for with your mare. But like one of the things that I really scratch my head with when it comes to ovary manipulation is they use a lot of generalizations and a lot of like really broad symptoms to say that this is a sign of ovary issues. So like the next blog post I found, and I just want to say like there's only two articles out there. Actually, the next one's not a blog post. It is like a journal article, but like loosely journal article. There's only two on the internet. So that's also like a big red flag for me that like There's only two articles out there available. Yes, they're written by vets. They're written by vets who are also um, EDOs, equine diplomats of osteopathic or osteotherapy medicines. So they do have that qualification to be talking about this subject, but it is really interesting like how few people are talking about it. Um, And that after those two articles, it's mostly what's shared on social media that's talking about these procedures right yeah and that's the first place i ever heard of it or saw it come up was in social media posts you know someone would comment on the horse's behavior and be like well have you checked their ovaries right and it makes me think that these procedures are probably not happening at the rate that social media perceives them to be happening it's not the same as ulcers you know like like you go and you can treat ulcers just to make sure that your horse doesn't have them and ulcers are very common i don't quite think ovarian i don't know i feel if it's I don't know. I do. I When we get to the like conclusion piece, I do like if you have someone who's super qualified in your area and they're going to do it in a specific way, which I'll talk about, <laughs> then I think it's okay. It's a good place to start. It's a place to start. But there's a lot of things that have to happen and a lot of boxes that have to be checked for it to be useful. Yeah. The second article is written by Jeannie Waldron, who's a um, vet and an certified uh, equine diplomat of osteotherapy. She This article is called Using Osteopathy to Diagnose and Correct a Displaced Ovary in the Grumpy Mare. And this article, like, it goes into details. It, the one book I could, or one, there's one book that uh, Vlogan wrote from the Vlogan Institute that shows how to go about manipulating an ovary. She has, like, all those images in this article. So you as a layperson can read it and figure out how to do it. But please don't do it. Um, Don't do it unless you're a vet. But she does include how to do it in her article. So basically, like, this article just has a bunch of generalizations about how horses that have painful backs. And she refers to a study that was done in France where it was discovered that horses with chronic back pain can become aggressive. 
And this is determined why ovaries can lead to back pain and then mares can become aggressive, which I think is like a big leap to take. But also, yes, horses in chronic pain can become aggressive. Like, yes, that we didn't need a study for that, but great. So she lists a bunch of like in hers and as well in uh, the first article lists a bunch of symptoms for ovaries manipulations or signs that your horse needs to have their ovaries manipulated. And it's things like lumbar pain, resentment to be tacked up, hypersensitive to touch, particularly in the flank and hind end, resentment to be blanketed, muscle tightness, reduced power from behind, unable to maintain canter leads or strike a particular lead, issue with circles on one lead, kicking out walls, hip rubbing, stallion-like behavior, gelding-like behavior, mare-like behavior, appearance of non-cycling, can't tell when she's in season, outwardly aggressive at certain times of the month, mild reoccurring colic symptoms, excessive urination, unexplained gait inconsistency, and cold back. But all of these are like really broad in general and could be 101 different things. She goes on to say like this problem can be diagnosed through immobility of the first three lumbar vertebrae along with immobility immobility in the sacrum and pole. The loss of mobility at the level of spinal lumbar nerve results in irritation, hypertonicity of the tissue supplied by nerves leaving the spinal canal as these are the restricted points. This could influence not only the ovaries, but also the uterus, bladder, and u- ureters. Ure- Ooh, that's not a word I know. <laughs> Ur- ureters, ureters, and consequently cause behavior issues. Uh, Careful osteopathic diagnosis and ovary palpation during colic and reproductive exams can help a large number of mares live a normal and more comfortable life. Pretty broad. Yes, pretty (laughs) broad. And I found an interesting uh, write-up that is in kind of response to ovaries, just ovary health in general, where there are a lot of people who are starting to look into performing ovarectomies, ovarectomies. Tommy, guys, why can't I say words? Anyways, people wanting to remove their mare's ovaries as it they believe that ovaries lead to a lot of behavior issues. So a 2017 assessment written by Sue McDonald, who's a PhD, uh, titled Behavior Problem, Ovaries Are Not, basically says that they have a lot of people that come presenting horses with ovary issues, and they find that very rarely is it an actual ovary issue that is leading to the behavior problem or the performance problem. They have a ton of other things that could be caught that they have found instead of, such as, you know, uh, mastitis, ulcers. So she has in that... uh, in that assessment, it's a really short assessment, and I wish she had gone into more detail about how often they found it to be other issues, like how often was it actually head shaker syndrome, how often was it sleep deprivation, or how often was it bladder issues or uh, urinary tract infection. Like she doesn't go into how often it's other things, which I was really annoyed by. Like, why did you write this whole article if you weren't going to explain, like, give us some evidence? But she does explain that they very often don't find it to be the root cause of the behavior to be uh, overrelated, that it tends to be like a hundred other things, but that they always start with the ovaries, that they always look at them first when horses come to their hospital in their vet clinic because they want to rule it out and then move on to other things. I mean, I guess that's a really good rule of thumb to go by though, is rule it out first and then move on to other things because That way people can't always fall back on that. And that's honestly how you handle anything with horses is, you know, if you're dealing with saddle fit issues, first you have to rule out, is it saddle fit issues? Is it something else, you know? Yeah, and I think it's just a process of elimination. Uh, Yeah, it's a process of elimination to figure out what is affecting the horse. Though her article, which came out, was published in 2017, I do find a little bit interesting because it actually goes against most of modern science when it most of the studies I was finding when it comes to ovaries that they are finding removing a mare's ovaries does have a huge impact on her behavior and that most people are satisfied when the ovaries are removed but they're also finding when they go to do these ovary removals that like 25 to 28 percent of the mares have tumors on their ovaries and so you are finding a lot of mares that don't have healthy ovaries to begin with and that could be a reason for uh, their behavior, but also a reason that their behavior improves once those uh, the tumors on those ovaries are removed. See, I'd be so curious in what the rate or like the, what the ratio is of mares that are suffering from you know tumors or unhealthy ovaries to 
healthy ones that came in and out of her clinic. And it's really hard. So I do have a study that I included in my notes I was going to talk about at the very end, but I can talk about it right now. So (laughs) this is a study that was published in 2020. Uh, It was conducted by the University of Copenhagen in Denmark titled Moody Mares is Overectomy a Solution. So what they did was they took 23 mares that had unwanted behaviors. So this is sort of my first issue with most of this research is they're relying on owners to identify mares with excessively bad mare behavior and use that as the metric to determine who or when ovaries should be removed. So this can be things like um, being aggressive to be handled or uncooperative on the ground. It could be kicking, bucking, rearing when ridden, or being aggressive towards other horses. And I think, again, this is some really big generalizations, and it could be a lot of different things. Because I used to be very, like, I believed for a long time that bad behavior was a sign of bad training. And then I went 100% the other way and was like, no, bad behavior is always a sign of pain or fear. And now I'm like back in the middle where like, it's probably a mixture of both. It is a sign of discomfort, whether that's mental or physical, bad training, you know, like pain. It's probably one or the other or both. And so relying only on owners, and that's what a lot of these studies are doing, is relying only on owners to determine behavior issues without some sort of assessment by a professional, I do think is a bit of an issue. And they, this study does put that in their conclusion that they should have, for future studies should have qualified people making that determination or non-biased or people who don't know the horses making the determination if there truly is an improvement in their behavior. So this study had, okay, it was 28 mares, not 23, sorry. So 28 mares underwent surgical ovarian removal. 14 mares had ovarian neoplasia in either or one of their ovaries. 10 mares had normal ovaries, and then the ovaries of the last four mares were not uh, examined for whatever for reason. They found that those mares who had their ovaries removed their rideability scores, as determined by the rider, increased by more than five points. So it was like 80% of the mares who had normal ovaries, their uh, riding, their attitude about riding improved. And then 57% of the mares with uh, ovary cancer, their improvement, their attitude improved. So eight of those with the cancer, they improved after their ovaries were removed. And eight of those without cancer, so it was only eight out of 10, 10 mares had normal ovaries, their behavior improved. So, but again, that was determined by the rider. I thought, I think it's an interesting study, but it's also like every study I found kind of concluded the same thing, that the only people that were not satisfied when the ovaries were removed were those who were trying to deal with laminitis that was related to their cycle and that removing the ovaries didn't have any effect on the laminitis and laminitic flares during their cycle. But that, I guess, would kind of make sense because I don't think laminitis is very tied to, of my understanding of laminitis is it's not super tied to their reproductive cycle, it's more tied to like their diet, time of year, that sort of stuff. So I like, so that is people are thinking that ovaries, ovary health is important. Um, where, how we got to ovary manipulation, I'm not entirely sure. When I look at, so when I try to find people who are qualified to do ovary manipulation is there's very few people that are qualified to do this in the world. And that's because you have to be both a vet and certified in some sort of equine osteopathy to be able to do this procedure because this procedure is a surgery since you're internal you often have to do provide prescription meds not all the time um do you have to sedate the horse but sedation can absolutely be necessary uh you also have to be a vet in order to diagnose or treat anything that's found so i was able to find nine people in the world that are qualified to do this procedure um Actually, I should add 10 because Louise Cosgrove is not on this list. That's not very many for how often you see people talking about it or saying to get it done. Right. So it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to stumble across somebody who is qualified to do this procedure. I think Jeannie Waldron, who wrote that article, I believe she's retired now. Uh, so I don't believe you. she's probably off the list. But what's really frustrating when it comes to equine osteo therapy and osteopathic treatments and just finding qualified people is that equine osteopathy is not considered a veterinarian medicine. So that means you have to go on to a secondary school to learn it, which is fine. Like chiropractic uh, is not also is not a veterinary medicine either. So you have to go somewhere else to learn it. 
But the issue with that is there's no standardization of these practices. And that's why it's not a vet uh, science. It's because there's no standardization. There's no nothing standard on how do I apply this treatment? How do I do it the same every time? How do I diagnose? How do I prescribe it? So there's not that science behind how this procedure should be used. And that's why I think Louise Cosgrove mentions in her article that this isn't based in science. And so vets are very uncomfortable using it and doing it because it is based on sort of your interpretation of the horse and feel. And you just kind of go off of how you're feeling um, and what the horse is telling you. But there are several different uh, groups you can be registered with, which is there's the World Alliance of Equine Osteopath. There is the International um, Register of Equine Osteopaths. There's the Animal Osteopathy Worldwide. So there's a lot of different organizations that oversee osteopathy, but they all have different standards, different qualifications, and they're all associated with a different school. So that's the other thing. So for example, if you're an EDO, an equine diplomat of osteotherapy, then that is someone who went to the Vlogan Institute. So you have, that's an indication of a very specific school you went to. So there's very few people that are qualified to do this procedure. So again, stumbling across someone who is qualified is is unlikely. You also need to be very careful of not just who is doing it, but how they're doing it. Yannick Vlogan does, he is the, basically he is one, he's considered sort of like the founder or one of the three founders of equine osteopathy. He's the one who is currently still teaching as the others are no longer with us. And he is, as far as I can tell, sort of the, one who developed, maybe along with Jeannie Waldron, this procedure for equine uh, ovary manipulation. But remember, he's not a vet in the United States. He's actually a doctor, like a human doctor. He's not a vet. So he has gotten in trouble with the state of Texas for performing procedures on horses for not being a vet, as well as the doctor, Dr. Luann Groves, who is a vet out of Texas, and she's the one who helps him with his school in Texas. She's also gotten in trouble for not documenting, like not keeping correct patient records. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of drama back and forth between Volgan, uh, Groves, and the Texas uh, Veterinary Medical Board (laughs) that I found. Well, that's concerning. It's more like paperwork. Uh, It's it's more like a paperwork stuff, but like Volgan did sue the Texas Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners in 2012 because they are trying to prevent him from practicing equine osteopathy and equine acupunctures, being an equine acupuncture and an equine herbalist and an equine massage therapist. But also he's a human doctor. He's not a, an animal doctor. So like, I feel like Texas has a right to try to stop him from doing that. And so he, but he filed a lawsuit against the Texas Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners. And then he withdrew it in 2014. And then in 2015, Texas sent him another like cease and desist letter. And then during that time span, they also fined uh, Luann Groves for bad patient record keeping because she did not actually perform an exam on this horse and she let Yannick perform the exam and do manipulations when he's not a qualified doctor and he also prescribed medicine but she got in trouble not him so like I don't I don't understand all the like exactly how that all weaved its way out but so do if you are having people come and do this procedure do be mindful of how it's supposed to happen but After listening to the podcast that Louise Quasgrove did, even though it was very intense, (laughs) her procedure for how she does it, I do think is a good starting point. So how she does it is she does start with a manipulation. She tries to do an assessment of the ovaries and of the reproductive system. And then after she's done with that part, she goes in with an ultrasound to ensure that everything she felt is what she suspected to confirm that yes the ovary is healthy she is looking for tumors she is looking for other veterinarian accepted issues going on with the ovaries so she does a complete exam it's not just going in messing with them and coming out she does finish with an ultrasound which i think is an important piece to this because you do need to actually know what's happening especially if things feel weird or even if they feel fine you need to uh, confirm that as best as you as you can and not leave a horse, not not treat a horse that needs it. So that's also something you can, I learned you can get a fine for. You can get in a lot of trouble if you do not properly diagnose a, a vet or an animal who's in your vet care 
for whatever it is. Um, that animal goes on to be diagnosed and treated by another vet. You can get in a lot of trouble. So make sure that whoever is performing this procedure is taking all steps to properly diagnose anything that is going on and not just wiggling stuff around. Huh. Interesting. That's mine. I did have a little bit of history on who created osteotherapy because he's actually kind of interesting, but maybe I don't I don't know where to put that. He was a lightning bone setter. I just want to throw that out there. He was a lightning bone setter, which we know what a lightning bone setter is from our Beamer episode. And what is that? That's where you stick the two needles into someone's uh, broken bone and electrocute it because... Oh! Yeah! No. <laughs> we know that... <laughs> no! Yeah, so he was also... No, 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 no. He was also a magnetic healer um, and a lightning bone setter. I thought you said lightning phone center. And I was like, I don't I don't understand what that is. No. Phone via lightning? A lightning bone center and a magnetic healer, which I thought was like, hey, we've done episodes on both of those topics. And he's also the creator of osteopathy. Very interesting man. Very interesting man, if you, if you want his history. Huh. All right. Is it my turn for gelding scars? It is. Castration manipulation? Go for it. Tell me tell me about, about that. Because that's actually... I'm sorry. I'm super confused. So for... Gelding scar manipulation, you do that internally too? There's two ways to go about dealing with it. Yeah. Okay, because I saw someone post on Facebook that she was like, my vet did it and he got tons of gunk out of his scar. And I was like, <gasps> whoa, what? So I was just like super confused <laughs> as, as to like what, what it is. So, okay, go for it. Take it away. There's two ways to go about it, but we'll get to that point. We're not going to start there. What we're going to start with is just saying briefly what I'm sure everyone has already anticipated up to this point, but will not be surprised by there's no research on it. Oh, yeah. Right? There's research into gelding horses a little bit here and there, but nothing that looks at the, like, what really long-term effects of gelding horses necessarily, the gelding scars, nor is there anything on, like, actual manipulation of the scars. There's no research on it. And I'm kind of on the fence of it because with ovarian manipulation, I to me, it's, that seems a little bit more wishy-washy because ovarian manipulation, they recommend that it gets done more than once. Like, it's mm-hmm. something that your horse should have done somewhat regularly right yeah it's supposed to be checked like every 18 months and if they're healing from something it could be once every month you have to do it depending on what's going on to me that just doesn't seem right that that seems weird to me i don't i mean i will throw back though like chiropractic depending on your horse like adeline is supposed to get chiropractic adjustments every three months because you have to like right get the body back in place then develop the muscles make sure it's working it's like a check and balance the ovary manipulation right is a little bit different i feel like but but that's an external like that's an external thing being done to your horse i feel like an internal pause what the other thing about louise cosgrove this is sorry it just reminded me she actually does also recommend muscle and rehab stretches and exercises for the mare once she's completed the process so she did do that in the podcast I listened to she then gave them a bunch of pretty intense exercises like backing up the horse uh pole work uh there was one other exercise that she gave I can't remember what it is so she was it was very complete her assessment of the horse not only did she ultrasound she also finished with rehab exercises and I was like that I really was it's it was complete so I did really appreciate that and that's why like if she shows up in your town and wants to do it I'd say go for it um I would be curious some of these other people what their program is no that makes sense because with any like chiropractor procedure or something of that nature it is a full body approach in that right we all know you can't do chiropractic work and expect it to stay there if you haven't also done the massage because those muscles have already set to one position and they'll just pull things back out of the place to what they were before correct I do appreciate that, that she put that into a whole body approach. But like, I, I don't know. I'm still on the fence with it. But gelding scar and castration manipulation, that is a once, a one and done operation procedure. Okay. Which no matter if you have the internal one or like actual have a surgery. When I was reading about it, it you know, when vets are explaining it to me, it sounds logical. And, you know, I don't disagree with necessarily what they're saying. It's just hard for me to fully get behind it because – I can't find any before or after scans of like scar tissue following mm-hmm. manipulation, nor do we have any like hard numbers to fall back on, mm-hmm. which is frustrating because that's, yeah, that's just, it's just a hard one. And I think honestly, that would really help with the ovarian manipulation because I'd be super interested in hormone levels after and before like they get manipulated, like if there's any difference. Cause I know how you were talking about with the sign like behavior, if they have a tumor, it causes more testosterone to be produced, right? And dumped into the body. 
And so I'd be super interested in, you know, what blood work looks like before ovarian manipulation occurs and after. But I don't know. I guess that doesn't necessarily carry over if we're looking at it as more of a chiropractic type procedure. So I'm kind of torn on that. There are a few, uh, quite a few different blog posts that I found done by vets that talk about this topic. Once again, most of them were just blog posts and like one or two articles. But one of the blog posts that I found, I kind of laughed at because right in the beginning, the guy goes, you know, that this isn't, there's no research behind it. This kind of stems from the osteopathic fraternity. And that's kind of, it made me laugh because I was like, that's kind of a good way to refer to it because I feel like there's always new osteopathic stuff popping up on social media and it feels it almost feels like it's falling into that club sometimes with different things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So the one blog post I found was off of equitopia.com by DVM Diane Isbell. And then there was another one from the Australian vet off of exclusively equine. And then I did listen to a podcast off of Healthy Horse, uh, Happy Hound mm -hmm. with castration manipulation with uh, Dr. Louise Crosgove, where she was arm deep in a horse in the field doing the procedure as like the lady was interviewing her. And I was like, this is weird, but I guess interesting. It's commitment. It is commitment to her uh, practice. And I think that's all Louise Cosgrove, from what I could tell, does. She just, like, travels around Australia doing this procedure. So I also want to, like, she probably has a lot of experience at this point that I don't know. Like, I would trust her, but I don't know how willing I would be to trust someone else to do this to my horse. Uh, the Listening to the podcast was pretty interesting because, right, you can talk about it all day long, but listening to her as she walked you through the process of it made it make sense a lot more and it was just an easier breakdown to digest and understand mm -hmm. so that was really cool and really nice to hear in my podcast that i was listening to a bird almost pooped on her did that happen in yours oh no 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 it did not she was just the only real exciting thing was the fact that she was arm deep in a horse yeah yeah definitely arm deep also we'll definitely put a link to that podcast in the in the show notes so you oh, guys yeah. can listen to it as well because we've actually referenced it quite a few times she has one on ovary manipulation and gelding scar manipulation and that was the healthy horse healthy hound podcast she's a, a lady out of australia it does open with a rhyme i will th let, warn you about that her opening is a <laughs> rhyme so be ready it's a cute little poem but it is rhyming the one that I listened to, it wasn't crazy long or anything. It was only 25 minutes or something. So it was pretty easy just to yeah, same. listen to relatively quickly. And I would actually recommend going and listening to it because it, it is interesting. Just mentally prepare yourself for the fact that you're listening to someone that has their arm up the rump of a horse. And the sound quality isn't great because they are outside in like Australia mid-jungle afternoon. All right. Before we get any further into gelding scars and castration manipulation, I just want to tell you what the castration procedure might be there is two different kind of ways they go about it one is the horse can be standing up and then there's the other where the horse is laying down the next step is preparing the incision site and injecting local anesthetic into it the incision is made into the scrotum near the midline and the testicles and then they just essentially go in there and remove it and there's a stump left after they remove the testicles and this stump is what causes the scarring to go become more serious and potentially cause issues because the stump is then released and it recoils into the body but t the testicles start behind the kidneys and as the horse matures they migrate down into the scrotum and so that stump when they remove the testicles can recoil pretty far into the horse's body so essentially what results after the horse is castrated is that sometimes with castrations the remnants of that stump, which is also known as the spermatic cord and the cremaster muscle, can sometimes scar down to the skin or to the tissue on the outside of the abdominal wall or the inguinal ring. And this can cause significant discomfort to the horse because the stump created when the castration occurs can form adhesions anywhere from the scrotum to the internal um, abdomen, but most commonly these adhesions occur on the bladder and the cecum, but they're certainly not limited to these limited to these areas because they can occur all the way to the kidneys wherever that stump might recoil into the body. I'm just imagining like a little bungee cord to have like that snaps and just like snaps back in them. Like someone like jumped off a bridge, it snaps or like maybe doesn't. And like, it, you know what I'm saying? Is that what you're imagining too? Just like a bungee cord coming all the way kind back? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, they cut it and then that like thing that they just cut because it no longer is attached to mm -hmm. whatever it was attached to the testicles, it just recoils into the body. That does sound really gross. 
there is a distance, right? It might recoil all the way back to the very beginning, but it might only recoil a, like a certain distance. So that's why these adhesions and the scar tissue can range in different horses. Like there can be a buildup of scar tissue in one area on one horse, but in another horse that stump might recoil farther or into a different location and you might have scar tissue in a different area of the horse's body. So signs if, of your horse suffering from this, the most prominent one or the biggest sign I don't know why I wrote specifically geldings. For some reason, I felt like that needed to be specified. I don't know. <laughs> you won't notice these signs in a mare. I don't know if this is a common sign. I think you might have mentioned it was a common sign for your mares with ov- ovaries and needing ovarian manipulation. But the most dominant sign and one that can kind of make you be like, oh, this could possibly be something I might need to check out is when your gelding has an aversion or will not pick up a specific lead. Yep, yep, that's a big one for ovaries as well as that lead. Yeah, another one is trouble with downward and upward transitions. Uh, Number three, really difficult, you know, at any time that they have to use their hind end as that will pull on the cremaster muscle and the inguinal ring, that will cause them pain and they'll be, they'll have like a reaction to that, right? Anytime they're having to activate their hind end, kind of use their core is like, because it will pull on that scar tissue that might have attached to the adhesions that might have scarred in different areas of the horse's body. Okay. Do you think that's why Dublin cries when we go up hills? I might actually, yes. I was thinking about Dublin a lot when I was reading through this. I think... Because I've never met a horse that cries going up hills except for Dublin. And that is like, it's that's just a really weird red flag. Like, that's just a really weird thing for a horse to do. Maybe. And I wouldn't doubt it. Because so the whole time I was reading through this and like gelding scars and everything is like, yeah, that totally makes sense. Right. Because when you look at the ovarian stuff is it's just the horse's body. Right. Yeah. You haven't done anything to it yeah. unless they they're sick and they have a tumor. Gelding scars. We are performing a traumatic surgery on their bodies by removing their testicles. Sure. So, and the body's desi- not designed for that to happen, right? Um, the body's designed to maintain exactly. the ovaries. It's not designed for the testicles to leave. Exactly. So no matter what, you have removed those testicles, your horse's body is going to scar. There, you know, you have like rehab procedures after your horse has been gelded. How you're supposed to go about it, that way you limit the scarring. Mm-hmm. And it totally makes sense because anytime a person is also is a risk with colic, surgery is that you open up that abdomen that's not supposed to be opened up and when it heals those adhesions will form and like attach different things that weren't originally attached to one another that when you move now you're feeling that painful pull the same thing happens is like imagine you remove the testicles from in between your horse's legs and now every time he's having to activate his hind end and use that muscle activating that muscle and that's why it makes sense that they have a hard time picking up a certain lead is because it's pulling on that scar tissue and that muscling and it's painful for them. Interesting. Yeah, he didn't have the lead issue, but the like using his hind end to go up a hill, my horse would whine and cry trying to do that. Like he he hated it so much. He would throw fits at the bases of hills. Like we have, we used to laugh about it. Now I realize that it was probably definitely a sign of pain. Oh, for sure. He would throw fits at the base of hills. He hated hills. I mean, looking still does. Looking back at Dublin, he showed a lot of signs of pain that like could have been if I knew the knowledge I have now. Yeah. Right. I, he would be a totally different horse if I were able to go back in time. But yeah, that is that is one of those like the hill one never made sense to me because he was a fit horse. Like, why does this fit horse not like that? But it was such like a prominent attribute in his personality was that he hated hills. Yes. He hates hills. And then in more severe cases, another sign of it can be that the horse isn't necessarily lame, but they have like a general air of unsoundness, such as like gait anomalies, but no real true lameness present. And that can like show up in, you know, disunitedness in the canter, spinal flexion or extension restrictions, resentment for a particular lead, inability to maintain posture. And while these symptoms can be very broad and typically apply to a multitude of potential issues, so trying to narrow it down and diagnose it can be tricky it's definitely something to check out. And I don't know if you can necessarily do this with ovaries to see if it's causing your may or pain, but with geldings, a way to check it is you can do a nerve block of that area and see if the horse's performance improves. And if it does, there's a good chance that that scar tissue is causing discomfort. Where do you do the nerve block? In the, like the lumbar area or where? Um, I believe it'd be around the scar, like where that, wherever you, the testicles used to be. So probably around okay. the sheath or somewhere in between their legs. Yeah, it wouldn't be in the lumbar. Okay, because for mares, like the lumbar is like a big part of the ovary issue because they're 
hanging from there. But remember that time when we Dublin was lame and we could never figure out what was going on. We blocked every joint in his hind legs and he was still lame. And the only thing we were like, I guess he has a dirty sheath. That was the only thing we came to. Gosh, this is making me think so much about Dublin. Yeah, I actually, I really wonder about it because I don't know how he was gelded. Laying the horse down to geld them, while it does come with different complications, it is one way to help reduce scar tissue. Yeah. And the scarring. I have no idea how he would have been gelded. Interesting. Yeah. And so if you've had your gelding fully checked over scanned and nothing has turned up this could be the next step to seeing if something is going wrong and impacting their performance is try doing a block of that area and see if their performance improves which i really like because that's more of a you can visually see a difference in your horse's performance than like just you know the ovarian manipulation yeah so i I do i like that aspect of this however you're probably wondering you know that's great now we've identified that we've probably seen this issue in a horse or two How do you go about fixing it and rehabilitating it? And unlike the ovarian manipulation is this is a one and done Mm -hmm. instance. This is you take care of it once and you don't have to revisit it. If someone's telling you that this has to be done regularly, absolutely do not let them stick their hand up your horse's bum because they they are not prepared. So there's two methods to fix this madness. The first one is castration scar manipulation. Obviously, that's what we're talking about. And the other one is surgery, performing surgery on that area. And how they go about it is a vet will lay down the horse and carefully open up, dissect that area where the scar tissue is. And most of the time, right, life is life. Scar tissue doesn't just grow in one location. It grows as like a set of strings, kind of like a spider web, just all over. And during the surgery, the vet will go in and cut away the adhesions to make the horse more comfortable that they can. Some are going to be a little bit too small. They can't quite cut away them. But in an instance like this, they would be able to do some removal of the scar tissue. The most important part really comes in when the horse is recovering from the surgery and it is essential that the horse is brought back into work very gradually as to avoid injury when they begin to use their body differently, right? Because much in the way of suspensory injury, after that surgery, the horse begins to use and like weight their body differently than they have been for years. And so the tissue is weak or it's not used to carrying the burden in such a way and utilizing themselves in such a way. Interesting. The other way to go about fixing this is scar manipulation which is similar kind of to the ovarian manipulation where you got to stick your arm up the horse's bum. So (sighs) good luck convincing your gelding that this is a great idea. Yeah. Most of the time, and in fact, I would argue all the time, you have them sedated for it. Most of the time they should be sedated. Just go ahead and sedate them because horses, the dangers of this procedure is um, risk. You risk perforating the rectum during the examination, which can be fatal if the tear goes completely through the rectum. And horses are very delicate back there. Honestly, probably most are pretty delicate back there. Cows are a little bit less delicate, Mm -hmm. but horses are very delicate and it's very easy to tear things in their body. So you got to be really careful. So before they go in to do the scar manipulation itself, the the vet, whoever's performing the procedure, has to do a methodical abdominal examination. And that does probably involve them sticking their hand up the horse's rump to identify, you know, where the adhesions are, what can be broken down and freed through gentle manipulation of the horse's body. And then they, I guess, just stick their arm up there and try to break up the different scar tissue and adhesions that are attaching to different parts of the horse's body. So that's how they, that's how they manipulate it. Personally, I think the surgery option sounds a lot better than sticking my horse sticking someone's hand up their butt but how did how do you avoid additional scar tissue being created with an additional like you've made another incision you're going back in how do you avoid making more scar tissue you have to be really careful when you rehab them that movement getting them moving is really important but it's not you know strenuous movement it's light gentle walking making sure they're not just standing still and things are scarring the way you really go about making sure this doesn't happen is that original castration And to be sure that the scarring is healing properly is you should check on them after about 12 months after they've been castrated to see how the scar tissue is growing, how the scar tissue has developed and see, you know, will they be in need of this procedure? Interesting. Now I'm thinking of my gelding who was gelded. Hudson? Yeah, because he was gelded a year, a year ago, two years ago now. He was laid down, but he was also able to get up and like move right away. And it's interesting because back in like the 50s and 60s, gelding a horse was considered like a really uh, intensive procedure. They needed to not eat before the procedure. They needed to be locked in a stall for several days after. It was very different than how it is 
perceived now. Now with like both the horses I've had recently gelded, you know, we want them up and moving almost immediately. You want to like lunge them, get them walking, trotting right away, trying to reduce any swelling. Very quick, it's, you know, down on the ground, back up. Like it's a much different procedure than it used to be perceived. So I wonder like, is there a change with how is science catching up to this sort of idea, even like accidentally or how, how that change has occurred? I have no idea, but it honestly, reading through this, right, I started off and I was kind of on the fence with gelding. I mean, I was probably more leaning towards like gelding scar manipulation isn't legitimate and not necessarily something you should have done. But the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, this is a traumatic surgery that we're doing Mm -hmm. to horses. You don't necessarily need to, you know, restrict them from eating before the surgery now like you used to. And movement afterwards is a really important part to the recovery to make sure that they're getting blood flow to that area and they heal as well as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, this is a traumatic surgery we're doing to their bodies. It would make sense if they have long lasting issues from it. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's all very interest, very interesting. To help prevent scarring right from the get-go, if you have a young horse that you're going to get gelded, it's better off to lay them down for the procedure rather than the one where they're standing up, as well as after 12 months following they've been castrated, it's a good rule of thumb to get them checked just to make sure scar tissue, if you do have adhesions developing or they have developed, take care of them right then and there. And then once it's once you've handled it, it should be good. Like that scar tissue, those adhesions aren't going to develop again. Any questions, comments, concerns? I have a few conclusion thoughts that I just want to like, oh, go for it, throw out. So this, both of these are osteopathic procedures. We talked a little bit about osteopathic medicine, but not really in detail to what it is. So osteopathic medicine, I want to throw out, is a protected title, which means what is being performed on horses is not true osteotherapy, osteopathic medicine. So using those titles is sort of like, it is sort of a gray area because what is being performed on horses, not just ovary manipulation, gelding scar manipulation, is osteopathic inspired manipulations but osteopathic medicine itself is only has only been accepted and recognized for humans and it's a complete medicine so it includes surgery it includes prescribing but the whole idea behind it is like a whole body approach so it sounds really awesome I think it's a great the idea is that not just treating illnesses it's about preventing illnesses and making sure the entire horse and human are healthy so I think it's a great path, uh, a great, you know, medicine and a great body work uh, to include in your day to day. But it is one of those, like, it's a protected title and the way it's being used in horses is not correct. And so I don't know if there have been some like legal issues with it specifically in Texas. I don't know if there's other issues with it in other states. So that might be something as more people become certified or become interested in this path that you might start to see some legal issues with it because it is not recognized as uh, animal medicine but it is it does sound really interesting like when I research it Uh, and then the other last thing I wanted to throw out there because we are a little bit critical of you know ovary manipulation and gelding scar manipulations but I also want to counter that with veterinarians spend a lot of time learning how to diagnose limb lamenesses and that is one of like the big things they learn in school is how to spot a lame horse that's lame in the legs and understanding body lameness is something that is becoming more and more common but it's not where vets are taught to start and so getting a vet because when I look at it a lot of people will say does my horse need their ovaries manipulated or their gelding scar manipulation or these sort of practices, the common response I see from the vet community is, all right, hold up. Did you do a complete lameness exam? Did you nerve block? Did you do X, Y, Z for the legs? And I don't think that's a bad response because it might not, it could also be in the legs, but it's how vets are trained to start. They're trained to start with the legs. And so it is something you do have to like, there's this that balance where you have to recognize that it's not always the legs. It's can be other places in the horse and is it their ovaries is it the gelding scar 
it's a place to investigate if you're feeling stuck. But do make sure you have ruled out the legs as well. Like you've got to do a complete assessment of the horse and not just yeah. go one route or the other. And the thing that Louise Clausegrove made very clear is that there is an extensive rehab process as part of this, specifically for ovary manipulations, and that those of people who are struggling with it and having to do it every 18 months, every couple months, may also not be doing the extensive rehab that's required. But again, it could also be somewhere else in the horse's body that's causing them to not get their canter lead. Which I think is actually, from what I was reading about the topic, I actually really appreciated that it did look at the whole body approach, is that this wasn't necessarily the thing they told you to look at first off. Everyone that I was reading that was talking about it, all the vets that were talking about it, we're saying, you know, if you've checked everything else and now you don't know where to go, this is another option to look at. Or you got yeah. halfway through looking at everything else. Look at this as well. Like this is, it's not going to be the only thing. It's not going to be a very, probably your very first option that you look at, but it definitely is something to consider. Yeah. And that full body scan, fully checking your horse's body, super important. Absolutely. So those are some of my conclusion thoughts. But yeah, I think if you're interested in it and you have someone who is confident and who is going to be doing the full exam you know that does for mares that includes ultrasounding that may include blood work and that includes rehab then I think that it I wouldn't say no I also don't have a mare that I feel this is necessary with so maybe if I had a, if I had a mare Same. with more extreme behaviors or something I would be more interested in though Adeline her confirmation and her the fact that she cycles really softly like softly that's a weird word she's not very obvious when she's cycling those are all signs that she needs her ovaries manipulated so like even if you have a good mare that's also a sign that she needs her ovaries manipulated which I don't like how can it be both a crazy mare and a not crazy mare I don't know yeah I don't like that aspect I also didn't like they said that it it could be stallion behavior it could be gelding behavior and it could be mare behavior yeah like like, okay (laughs) then it's anything (laughs) exactly it's anything yeah so that I do that that does bug me that there's a lot of generalizations but ovary health is important when it comes to mares. Apparently, uh, studies have shown that over- removing ovaries seems to have a big impact on their health. Well, I would imagine so. I mean, anything that has to deal with messing with the horse's hormones is going to have a big impact. Hence, removing the t- like remove castrating the horse that has a big impact on their hormones. Right, absolutely. And that was something that at first I was like, "What? Your mare has bad behavior. Why would you remove her ovaries?" And then I was like, "Well, I guess we remove Gelding's testicles. I really don't see how maybe I'm crazy, but is there a huge difference? Like, I don't probably not from that perspective. We geld them because of the extreme hormone reactions they have. Right. Like- and we don't remove mare's ovaries because they're much harder to get to. Uh, but then, it, I, you know, it's interesting that if we're removing her ovaries, then what? Like, does that recoil? Like, then are we going to have a whole issue? I mean, this is a different topic for another day, but then does it get into that whole gilding scar thing where then, like, pieces of her are recoiling? Also, fun fact, if you drop her, your ovaries in the mare while you're removing them, you can just leave them. They did a study in 2020 what? that, yeah, you can just leave the ovaries in there. You don't actually have to take them out. Somehow that does not affect the mare. Do you think like someone dropped one and was like, oops, yes, I can't retrieve that. Yes. Should I just leave it in and see what happens? No, so what happened? That's what happened? So that's basically what happened is that uh, they would do, I think they do like a small incision in the flank and go up and get them. And then sometimes they drop them and then they have to do another incision in the abdomen, which defeats the purpose of ah! having one small incision in the flank. And so this 2020 study titled the effects of leaving amputated ovaries intra abdominally during elective bilateral standing la- laparoscopic ovarectomy in equids found that while surgically removing an ovary from a mare, it's dropped instead of opening up another hole. You can leave it and there's no like side effects. The mare seemed to recover just fine, which also really she just has a dead organ floating around. I feel like that doesn't seem that's like the equivalent of leaving a wrench in your car if you change the oil or something. Or like you doctors leave like bits and pieces in people somewhat too frequently. Like you're supposed to do there's like a count. You're supposed to make sure you've got all your cotton swabs, all your tools like you're supposed to inventory it before you close the person up. I can't imagine like did we get the did we get the organs we went in for? No, we left them. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's weird. Also, this is a, another topic for a different day. I was just thinking about this. You know, it's kind of funny how the whole time you were talking about removing the horse's, o- the mare's ovaries, right? I am very standoffish to that idea. And like, that's really going to affect her mood and stuff. And then I was thinking like, 
why don't I have that same opinion of geldings? Because it's so perpetuated that we we yeah. geld horses. Yeah, because that's exactly how I started too. I was like, ew, leave her organs alone. Like, there's no way her organs are affecting her behavior. Like, that's so weird. And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, what about our geldings? We take we the balls. Bo- yeah, so I don't know. But that's, yeah, I didn't dive deep into it. But there is a lot of studies and it's coming more and more popular to do elective over removal without them being cancerous but they're also doing them and discovering large chunks of mares have cancerous ovaries so like ovary health is something that i think has just been overlooked for a long period of time and i can't help but wonder is that because this started as you know a male dominated it you know career where men were vets to begin with and that's where a lot of the research has started from we now have a lot of female vets but like I'm sure mares PMS just like a woman does. And I'm sure things are swollen and there's cramping and they don't feel great. Hormones, man. Hormones have a big effect on, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, hormones have a big effect on your body. Give her a Snickers. I'm sure that will help. All right. Well, are we done? Are we good? (laughs) I think so. I think we covered it. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for listening to us today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you are thinking now about whether you have a gelding or a mare, their ovaries or their gelding scars, you know, it's something to think on. If you guys have questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach out to us at Gmail for, or in the barn no. pod at gmail.com. Yes. Or on Instagram at in the barn dot pod. Even though the Instagram feed is like very dead, it doesn't mean we don't still look at it. Okay. So I, I am the one in charge of our Instagram feed. I'll be honest. And um, if you look at, my other feeds and stuff i just i don't know man it's just dead i would say you're gonna post more on it but that would be a lie and i'm trying not to lie to you so we are where we are someday we have someday stay safe stay classy and uh maybe manipulate horses ovaries or their gilding scar find one of the eight qualified people in the world to do it for you yeah good luck it's a where's waldo game out there yeah there's nobody on the west coast just fyi if you live on the west coast nobody east coast there's a couple. Mm-hmm.